I am Austin Iveson. I'm a solution architect here at SUSE. You are ready to, well, you're here to see a presentation on, you know, virtualization specifically around some pieces with um, SUSE and Veeam. Uh, we'll be talking about Harvester and then Veeam's casting. And then I will also let um, Brandon here uh, introduce himself real quick. He is uh, a systems engineer over at Veeam. Hi hey guys, uh, Brandon Newell, Senior Systems Engineer at uh, Veeam, uh, working on the Caston product and uh, looking forward to giving you guys a presentation today. Perfect. And then also I'd like to thank Jamie Speck and uh, Sarah Hurley here who work at SUSE and have helped organize and orchestrate this entire thing. We couldn't do it without them. So, you know, big round of applause for them. Brandon will be, myself and Brandon will be looking in the chat. So if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. So just to kind of go over what we're going to go through for the agenda, um, I'm going to be talking about Harvester, uh, give you a nice little presentation, and then follow that up with a bit of a demo. And then uh, Brandon is going to do the same. So let's start with the Harvester overview. So another photo of me there, but essentially let's get into it. The nitty and gritty of it all is that, you know, according to Gardner and according to a lot of what I'm seeing from my own customers and interactions with people in the, the open source community, uh, cloud native platforms are probably going to be the largest staple uh, that you see inside of organizations. Uh, it's growing and it's going to continue to grow. And so with that in mind, you know, how are you going to be able to accommodate uh, an ecosystem that's changing from you know more traditional workloads with VMs to more containerized workloads, um, and that's where we believe Harvester comes into play. Um, so, where does Harvester sit within the timeline of uh, you know all of SUSE? Well, SUSE has been around for a really long time, uh, and as you can see here, uh, we've you know had SUSE Manager to manage. Uh, Linux operating or Linux distributions, uh, so you can do this through a multitude of servers. And then we acquired Rancher back in 2020 to start building up our container management platform. Uh, we've also acquired New Vector for uh, container security, and then we've actually created an open ELA uh, to support you know any kind of movement away from either RHEL or CentOS, because there's some end of life that's happening out there. So if you need Liberty Linux is uh, the distribution that you can actually just swap out. Uh, you don't even have to migrate your workloads, but you just swap out essentially where you get those channels from, version channels, and you have, uh, we ha you have us to support you. So now to talk about essentially what you're gonna wanna choose when you are building out a platform to serve to either your end users or internal uh, users. So whether that's going to be on a very traditional managed Linux uh, server, or if that is going to be in a traditional, or not a traditional, a new modern cloud computing aspect of Kubernetes, you know, where you can delve into the APIs of Kubernetes and extend and build out a platform that's reusable. Um, a big thing is that people wanna be able to manage this platform themselves and they wanna be able to do that in all sorts of environments and what those environments can look like, you know, you have edge use cases and you have data centers. So where can you fit in with uh, essentially our tools here? So specifically speaking, let's talk a little bit about Linux and Kubernetes here. So at the bottom layer, you've got the hybrid cloud infrastructure. So you can, again, do this in the data center, you can do this in edge, or we've got customers that are using our product in planes. We've got customers that are using them in, um, you know, on the factory line, uh, it, it, it's all over. And obviously in the data center as well. Um, and we support all of that. And then we've always wanted to be an interoperable and open source company. SUSE's ethos has always been, you know, choice matters, your guys' opinion matters, and you should be able to not have to deal with like vendor lock-in. So from an early on stage, you know, we had SUSE Manager, which manages, again, multiple distributions of Linux. Um, you can, you know, implement automation through there with using salt, et cetera. 
Um, but then we obviously have our own distribution of Linux as well. And we even have some other, you know, forms and flavors of Linux under our portfolio. So some of those uh, distributions would be SLE Micro. This is going to be a very small uh, immutable operating system and this is actually going to be heavily used inside of our uh, container management because we've, we've built this out with the intention of deploying that OS for uh, Kubernetes workloads, container workloads, etc. Yeah, and then uh, sitting on top of that, you know, Kubernetes is built on principles of Linux, as many people may know. And again, we wanted this to be an environment that you can support not only, you know, in the cloud with the major cloud providers, but you can also do this on your own bare metal. And that is what we want you to solve with Harvester. So if you have that problem of wanting to have multi, like hybrid cloud environments, and you can actually do this all within a single platform. And, and again, doesn't matter if it's at the edge, data center, you can use your bare metal uh, machines and split those up with VMs using Harvester, because as we know, there are other competitors out there that haven't been as friendly to the open source community. But again, we've built all of our tools using open source technology. And so if you want to manage the full life cycle of not only the distribution of uh, Linux, you can actually manage the full life cycle of your clusters as well. So Kubernetes clusters um, and what that looks like again, base layer, you know, enterprise Linux, you can, we support it all. You can put it wherever you want and then you can slap one of our distributions of Kubernetes on top of them. So we have K3S and RKE2, um, which is Rancher Kubernetes engine. And we maintain, we actually donated K3S uh, back in the day to the CNCF, and we still are the largest maintainers. So if you've heard of K3S, that is, you know, in due part to Rancher Labs back in the day. But once we were acquired Rancher Labs, you know, we donated K3S, and we actually have some other tools in the cloud native landscape, such as Longhorn. It's an incubating project, it is for block storage. Uh, we actually even acquired New Vector, and then we open sourced that as well. Um, so it's completely out there. For, you can download it open source, and you can have container security with a zero trust methodology methodology built into it. Um, and yeah, we really just want to make sure that you guys know that you know you have the open source community behind behind you with uh, when you choose to use SUSE product. So let's now focus in. Kind of, I gave you like the zoomed out perspective. Let's get into Harvester specifically. So, you know, as you can see down here, you've got the infrastructure of Harvester. Well, it was built in mind with a certain pieces, and I will talk about what open source tools we have built into it. Um, but it comes from a single ISO. You take this ISO, you put it on your machine, and you run through some steps. Um, that would be the manual process. You can also automate this with like Pixie Boot. Uh, we really want it to just be a turnkey solution. We've built operators and extended Kubernetes uh, with Harvester, and we, again, it's a it's a single platform for you to, you know, use the modern technology of container orchestration with Kubernetes as well as uh, virtual machines, so traditional workloads um, that have been around for a long time. And once you see the demo, you can see that we actually fulfill a lot of the needs that people have for their virtual machines with uh, Harvester. So some example use cases of what you can do with Harvester. So say you're a Rancher user uh, and you want to actually spin up a Rancher management cluster. Uh, typically you could do that you know, in the cloud, uh, you could spin up the EC2 instances, deploy an OS, put RK2 on there, or um, with Harvester, we actually have a use case where you can install that ISO that I mentioned, download it, put it on your servers, and then you'll have the ability to essentially put a virtual cluster on top of Harvester. Um, and I'll get into how that works and what that looks like, because again, Harvester was built with cloud native tools, so it is actually built with Kubernetes 
as the base layer there. Um, it's using KubeVert to manage the APIs. Uh, KubeVert is actually what is bringing up some KVM instances on the hosts, and I will actually talk about that as well. But you know, I just want to make sure I mention it so it all kind of trickles back into your mind. Uh, another use case for this is just strictly virtual machines. Um, you know, you can lift and shift, take some things from vSphere, uh, and bring that right onto uh, Harvester. It's all based on KVM. Again, a trusted, you know, open source virtual uh, hypervisor. It's been around for a long time. And then say you want to actually now use VMs for uh, Kubernetes clusters. You can actually do that with Harvester as well. So you want to spin up a virtual machine, or maybe you want to spin up 12 virtual machines and assign them roles in a Kubernetes cluster. And then all of a sudden you have your containers and services running inside of Kubernetes clusters that are all inside of um, Harvester VMs. Uh, it, Plenty of use cases here. This is just a few to outline so you can understand. And again, this allows you the ability to have essentially, a, you know, multi-platform. You can have an environment that fits your guys' need. If you just want a container and service inside of Harvester, you can do that. If you want to have um, Linux and Windows machines inside of Harvester, you know, Harvester supports that. And if you want to use our node driver for Harvester and spin up uh, RKE2 clusters, you can do that with Harvester as well. So let's get at that architecture level. Let's kind of take a gander of what, like I said, what is built um, inside of Harvester, what tools we're using, what open source tools. So as you can see here, um, Rancher Prime is up here at the top. It was built in mind Harvester was built in mind to essentially be imported into Rancher Prime uh, and you're able to manage not only your Kubernetes clusters but also your VMs with Harvester. Um, obviously you can have that standalone instance, uh, you can just bring up Harvester and use it to manage VMs, but that's what it was initially built with the idea of. And then there at the bottom, let's look at what OS we have. Like I said, Slim Micro is a huge huge playing a huge role inside of all of our cont uh, container orchestration like ideas it's an immutable operating system um, it does transactional updates and this is what's built into that iso i mentioned the other tools that are built into the um, harvester iso are rke2 that is a distribution of kubernetes and then obviously we have our distribution of kubernetes then we have longhorn for storage kubert is again that open source uh, virtualization tool that you know is in the cloud native landscape and we actually worked with them back in the day and wanted to give it a single platform with an opinionated stack essentially of how to accomplish virtual machines inside of kubernetes and then the container network is multis um, and so this is all being managed through one management network and then you have the ability to spin up vlans um, and then we also have VXLANs coming up and however many uh, VLANs you need to spin up. But again, I want to emphasize that Harvester is built on top of Kubernetes. So imagine, you know, you have a three node, as you can see here, Kubernetes cluster. That is kind of like the bare minimum that Harvester demands for best practices. And then the VMs get spun up inside of those three nodes, so those three hosts. Um, and so then on top of that, you can then again spin up multiple uh, Kubernetes clusters or just use VMs. So you can do this in the data center, you can do this in the edge, you can do this uh, all over. Again, you can manage all of these instances from a single place, and that is Rancher Prime. Some of the features we have today, like I said, the installation methods are you can use an ISO, you can pixie boot, it does support air gap. Um, we allow for multi multiple networks with Multis, um, VXLAN, which is going to allow for the segmentation, micro segmentation of VMs, because uh, obviously with with Multis, with whatever CNI you end up spinning RK2 clusters up, you can 
still accomplish micro segmentation there. Um, so we actually external storage is now supported. Uh, so the data disk, you know, through disk, it, you don't need to just specify Longhorn. You can actually move into uh, another preferred choice because again, we want we want to be open. Oh, we want to support the open source community. We are the open. We are very much part of the open source community. So if we support them, they support us, and so forth. Um, hardware support for mixing architecture is in Tech Preview, but it is a really cool use case in case you have, you know, some, like myself, some Raspberry Pis, for instance, at home. But anyway, um, let's uh, let's continue on. So single plane using RBAC through Rancher, you can access Harvester as well. I probably should I want to touch on that and again uh, this is all built with cloud native in mind and so because harvester is built on top of uh, a kubernetes cluster you can extend the use case of that cluster to use other tools inside of the cloud native landscape so if you're using uh, Argo CD, you know you have all of this behind you. You have all that, and that's where I really truly believe Harvester starts to thrive and shine is when you take into account that you have all of these other pieces that already work very well with um, RK2. So why why not take that into consideration and understand that you're not going to be locked into single single vendors, single things. Um, you know, when you use Harvester, you're going to have this behind you. So, you know, start talking about a little bit more of like the technical features in depth. Um, again, so if you upgrade Harvester, it's going to be the same ISO as if you were using a fresh install. Um, because we have that really cool SLE micro under the hood, it does a transactional update. You just have an easy upgrade through the UI. It says, hey, there's an upgrade available. Press that button. You're going to want to like shut down some VMs uh, uh, and make sure that there's you know, there's a whole best practices and you can follow the, uh, the guide there. And it will just do the same kind of rolling update as if you were to update a Kubernetes version, right? Uh, you know, cordon off, migrate the VMs to one node. That node gets upgraded, fall, so so on and so forth. So that's how you stay highly available even during like an upgrade process. Here's a bit of what that storage network looks like. Um, you know, again, we have Longhorn um, in this instance, but we just released. We we heard what the community wanted, and they said, "Hey, you know, we love Longhorn. It is a great open source tool, and we have tons of customers that use it as well." But you know, if you want to build that storage network using a different um, CSI uh, that is now supported, but this is what that looks like uh, right out of the box without any um, changes done to the CSI. So you have a dedicated network channel for storage replication. So you've got all of those replicas going throughout each of those nodes. Um, so you have multiple uh, volumes on creation of a VM essentially. So, yeah. Should, I'm going to check the questions. So I see each node shown in the figure with server icon. Does it mean each node is a virtual node? Um, okay, so previously on one of our previous slides, I'm going to go back. Sorry about this. Ah. So uh, these nodes here, it was asked if each of these are going to be virtual nodes. Um, no, you know, this is this is essentially bare metal. Like when you have um, bare metal servers, but you want to split up those VMs or you want to split up those nodes into VMs, um, you create a Kubernetes cluster with Harvester and then Harvester talks to Kubevert's API and Kubert's API then speaks to the host and says, hey, I need to spin up a VM using KVM. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, but yeah, I thought I would just show instead of tell. Um, but these are, these in this scenario, these are bare metal machines. All right, let me get to the storage network now. All right, so we're back here. And yeah, like I said, the CSI driver 
doesn't have to remain Longhorn, but this is very much how all the other CSI drivers would work with a storage network built in. Uh, we also do provide NVIDIA GPU and vGPU support. So we have uh, the hypervisor layer, uh, and then you can actually assign, as you can see here, you can select um, any GPU that you have and then plug it into that VM. So it does support machine learning and AI workloads, hot item, uh, as many know. And then let's talk about a little bit of the logging capability. So one of the things that are built into Harvester is uh, FluentBit. You can actually get logging for not only your um, Kubernetes cluster, but you can get it for the OS, for um, Kubeverts API calls, uh, and basically everything that's going on inside of the Harvester cluster. Uh, and so that is, again, applied through the same instances of uh, Helm charts that Rancher uses, if you're familiar with Rancher. Uh, if you're not, I'll give you a brief rundown during the demo, uh, because again, this is, all, this is all interconnected and it gives you that single plane. So if you wanted to talk about single root um, IO, this is also, we've enabled the pass through there within Harvester, so you can actually, you know, access um, your root and you're able to essentially yeah, use this. This is absolutely a function and if you want to see what a pass, uh, the CSI pass-through looks like, this, I really like this slide because it demonstrates, again, the Harvester cluster exists. This is an RK2 cluster. You have your CSI driver and then how do you actually spin up volumes? Well, you can do that for each volume itself and it automatically builds a volume that you specify the size of um, and then Longhorn is managing it. Well, if you spin up Kubernetes clusters and then assign volumes to a container inside of that cluster, it also is passing through and going into Longhorn. Because um, again, since this is all built on top of um, you know, modern technology of Kubernetes, you are able to uh, essentially have access to a single place for your storage as well, for not only your v, uh, VMs, but also for your Kubernetes clusters. We have load balancing service built in, so you can automatically deploy and configure it uh, to any of the specified CRDs that you have. Um, so, you know, traditional VMs or your Kubernetes workloads as well. And then, one thing I like to talk about too, and this is kind of like the last uh, sort of technical slide, uh, we do support uh, migrating, obviously, from OpenStack and VMware here, and we actually have automation tools surrounding that, copies specs of your VMs, and transfers it all over, and even brings over those MAC addresses as well. Um, there's a bunch of documentation on how to do this, but that is supported. Check the questions real quick. See if there's anything. I've been answering them uh, off and on, uh, Austin, but uh, there's one left. Uh, if they were building a container image based on SLE Micro, is there a licensing fee for it? Uh, SLE Micro is completely open source. So, I mean, if you wanted support, uh, yeah. Uh, but you could go ahead and absolutely build a container that would run on uh, run on that. So, you, yeah, work. Completely open source. If you want, if you want support, if you need it um, for such things as compliance, if you need to reach out to us to help you, you know, follow the best practices. But no, you can go out there, you can download Sleep Micro and use it to your own will. Um, yeah, we have many, many tools you can build uh, Sleep Micro with. I don't know if you guys heard of the Open Build service. It is something that SUSE has created, and then it's completely free. It's a service that Kubernetes uses to build Kubernetes. Upstream Kubernetes actually uses our build service. Um, yeah, I, you can look that up. And, but yeah, there's no, there's no fee. Go ahead and you know, have at it is what I tell people. Um, and if you want to, if you want to talk about Sleep Micro, there's a whole other cool Edge webinar that's happening tomorrow. You know. Shameless plug for um, other technology, but man, I'm really proud of our Edge team. And if you're interested in that, I would look into it. But yeah, I digress. Get back on to Harvester. Um, well, Harvester is built on Sleep Micro, so yeah. 
anyway, but um, real world success stories. Arm actually uses this, uh, so they actually use the entire rancher stack uh, with Harvester, and they deliver a, a repeatable platform to their uh, 2,500 engineers. Uh, they've got SLEs running under the hood for their rancher nodes and uh, you know those type of things, but then they have a Harvester there as well, which they can bring up Kubernetes clusters at will. Um, EMW, uh, they actually, you know, they tout that they spin up like a million or so VMs uh, every month and then tear them down using Harvester. You know, they did this so they can uh, work within their 5G network because as you can see, we have things like SRI, SRILV pass through. So you're able to um, essentially access some of those things that they need for their 5G. Um, Viasat uh, is an industry or is a is user if you might have heard you know aviation i said we have customers that use our software in planes well biaset is um doing that you know they deliver entertainment at the back of those seats using things like k3s using harvester using a longhorn so you should be if you've flown in a plane you might be staring at a SUSE screen essentially um you know a SUSE supported screen by by biaset um Banking, they reduced a lot of costs by essentially migrating to our open source platform. And then they, again, use the entire stack, K3S, Rancher, Harvester. More use cases here, less time and effort because there is so much autom automated, there's so many automated tools that we support with Rancher. You know, you've got fleet for continuous de uh, deployment that's built into Rancher. Uh, we actually have a Terraform provider that we maintain, uh, and we actually can implement that with both Rancher, uh, the applications that we support within Rancher, and also, uh, you know, Harvester as well. And so, now that I've shown you a ton of slides, I'm going to get into a Harvester demo, and I will show you what that looks like. So, today... What we're looking at, I'm going to just give this a little plus one, um, maybe a plus, do a couple. So I am in my instance of Rancher. I have essentially imported a Harvester cluster here, but this is where you're going to land pretty much anytime you want to interact with Harvester. And if you see this nice little hamburger menu in the top left, you would press that and you'd say, see that you have virtualization management. So to talk about this real quick, Rancher is living in this local cluster here. Again, to illustrate a hybrid cloud environment, you know, I get a budget in AWS um, provided by SUSE, and I've actually created um, a three node cluster that is using RKE2 up in the cloud, and then here at home, I actually have another cluster that is running on two servers, two machines, and it is my harvester cluster. Um, so let's look at what it would look like to essentially land into the page for managing VMs. You know, again, this is a great illustration of what it looks like to have a hybrid environment um, because the way Rancher works, uh, this just sends information up this being Harvester sends information up to Rancher and it allows um, for seeing things like air gapped environments and so forth. Uh, this dashboard is built out to be very similar to how you would interact with Rancher. So, you know, maybe I should have done a poll, but uh, hopefully a fair amount of you are familiar with Rancher. Otherwise, this is going to be completely new. So, I will touch base on Rancher here in a moment um, just to show off some capabilities that Harvester lends to it. But as you can see here, I have two hosts. These are going to be those two servers that I have at home. And then I actually can do things like enter maintenance mode, cordon them off. And because it's all built with the Kubernetes under the hood, it would, if I were to cordon this, it would transfer all these virtual machines from one node to the other. So see, I have um, a demo cluster here, or sorry, <laughs> demo VM here. This is actually a 
a clusters VMs that would be managed inside of Rancher, and these VMs you can manage inside of Harvester. So yeah, just making sure that's clear. But as you can see here, this one VM is on node two. And if I wanted to do a live migration, we actually do have that ability. So I could do you know, live migration is supported. I just go in here, select this node and press apply. It'll start migrating. And I will take a sip of my drink so my throat doesn't get too dry as I talk. Austin, while you're doing that, another question came in about uh, taking a harvester cluster and replicate to the cloud. And I think this is a great uh, example here of, of migrating uh, from one harvester node to the next. Couldn't we stretch those across to the cloud? That is a great question. So are we asking if we want to stretch the VM, take the VM and essentially put it into the cloud? Uh, the the uh, question was around DR, so for DR purposes to basically replicate to uh, the question oh. was to replicate to the cloud. So yes, okay, perfect. So a DR situation, so that'd be handled by um, your CSI driver, and uh, you know we're gonna have uh, Brandon's gonna do a whole demo on how you can essentially secure your data, but Longhorn itself actually allows for you to back up to an S3 bucket. Um, so you could do that, you know, in the cloud. You could. I have an S3 bucket that I throw all of my personal, um, like Kubernetes-related Longhorn backups into. Uh, and so since this is again all built with that in mind, uh, that same use case is going to be there. And I can actually show you what it looks like to manage the Kubernetes cluster that is Harvester in a moment. Um, but as you saw, this live migration here, um, it went from Harvester to uh, to Harvester One now did that live migration and then we obviously have options to uh, help that answered your question by the way I, and yeah I'll, I'll actually show you the, what Longhorn is doing under the hood inside of the Kubernetes cluster itself but yeah you can absolutely like a disaster recovery situation back it all up um, so if we wanted to do something like log into a console this nice little um, um, maybe that is going to be, I'm going to have to change my screen real quick. Because I'm realizing that you guys can probably only see my um, one window. Now, you can probably see my login screen that opened up on another window for my VM. Um, is that correct? That's correct. Perfect. So I have this. Um, I have this VM up and running. I just SSH'd into it essentially, and I can start running commands. I can do whatever I have. This is a SLES, um, SUSE Linux Enterprise Cloud-based uh, VM, and I've already got access to it just from this cloud. Uh, sorry, from this console instance that I clicked on by doing this. You obviously have VNC as well. So if you wanted to have like a virtual uh, interface there, you also would get that as well. Um, so yeah, um, pretty cool there. Let's say we wanted to figure out how to create a virtual machine. Well, uh, let's do that by going into this create button. And as you can see, you can bring up multiple instances so you can specify how many VMs, you can do one at a time. Uh, I'm just gonna do demo. 2.0, I'm gonna actually just demo two. I'm gonna specify the CPU here. I'm gonna say eight. I'm gonna you know, give it let's give it 20 memory because I've got the not the tau to my own horn, but I've got a lot of RAM to give to my uh <laughs> my uh, VMs. And then if we wanted to actually do some more advanced configuring, um cloud uh cloud config, so cloud in is actually built into these VMs. Uh, a lot of my personal like interactions with customers with with users love this implementation and I actually have a, a whole configuration that is spun for you guys and ready to go so I can click create here oh I actually have to go into the volumes obviously select the image and then I'll even bump up this volume size to say 50 um, and just double check everything it will probably scream at me if I didn't click it but now this is going coming up and I'm you know have another VM coming 
to fruition. So let's see how long that takes. Um, is there any other questions while I we wait for this? And doesn't seem like it, but you know, I don't know if I would have had enough time to answer it anyway, because the VM's up and running. Um, in reality, it's probably going through some bootstrapping process here on the VNC, but you can actually watch that entire automated process happening. Um, so as this boots up uh, SLEDS 15 on service pack six, you can actually see it all right there. All right, so um, where did those, where did that image come from? Um, I like to specify this and show you that you can actually, you know, create a VM or not VM, sorry, you can bring an image from a URL. I've actually put, uh, you know, so like from an S3 bucket, if you wanted or so, somewhere, wherever you want to download the uh, image from, you can actually also upload it directly from your personal machine. Uh, this networks that you may want to create. So you have your cluster networks. So this is going to be that management network that we saw in the presentation slides um, in this VM network, this is where you would create a network, a VLAN for your VMs. And I've actually created this for, um, it's my default VM network, and this will be a great uh, segue into what you'll see when I create a Kubernetes cluster, because this gets referenced um, and then automatically puts a bunch of VMs onto this network. Um, you can obviously, if we want to talk about backups and snapshots, you can come over here and you can actually see that there's going to be like, take a backup, take a snapshot. Um, those all are capable and they're all kept here in this location. And so, you know, I feel like that is a good basis of what Harvester can do inside of the VM aspect or just a single VM or uh, being brought up, but let's do a little bit of exploration inside of Rancher to see what that looks like. So if I click on this home button, that takes me out of the virtualization management and it brings me back here. Um, so if you want to, again, have your own Kubernetes clusters, if you use vSphere no driver inside of Rancher now, we support that. Um, we obviously can create a cluster using Harvester as well. So as you can see here, VMware vSphere, we also have Harvester as an option. Again, you can make clusters in the cloud um, using their distributions of Kubernetes. You can make you can make Kubernetes clusters inside of uh, the cloud using our distribution if you want, um, or you can make it on-prem. And so this node driver here is created and it references a cloud credential which is tied to my harvester cluster and it would be a very similar interaction um, so you're not going to have a lot of you know you're not going to have to learn one tool or the other really because if you want to create kubernetes clusters in a way that's very easy ai easy ai art is my initials by the way i am not hype hopping on the hype train that much um i just you know i was that was the original AI. Um, I, that's so corny, but yeah, you know. So I can specify the memory here. I can specify the default namespace. Same images. This is all being referenced inside of the Harvester cluster. I'm going to give the SSH user that. And then that network that I mentioned previously, I created that VM network in Harvester, and now I can reference it, reference it when I'm creating a Kubernetes cluster. And then I can actually come in here and uh, run these commands. I can reference that user data that I previously referenced as well. Again, gives you a single plane for not only your VM workloads, but your Kubernetes workloads. And then I can click create. I'm not gonna change any of this cluster configuration. I just configured the VMs, the machine pool. Um, they have all the same node, same roles. You can specify, you can even add um, so, for instance, if you wanted, you know, uh, to split up the workload between workers or you wanted um, just pools specifically for, you know, etcd or control plane, you can all specify that within this form and then you can click create. I'm going to actually minus that and let's see here. We've got one pool. I'm gonna click create and we're going to see this start coming up. So AI Easy is spinning up 
And if we actually came back over, so again, this is Rancher, we're actually looking at Kubernetes clusters. So if I come back over to the virtualization management tool, you can actually see Harvester running. So if I come here, uh, you can see that it's starting up that VM. So I hope, I, I hope that makes sense of how easy and seamless it is to transition between the two, uh, you know, Kubernetes management platform and then the, uh, the hypervisor aspect. Um, and so what I want to do now is back it up and say, hey, you know, I actually want to adjust and extend uh, the capabilities of that harvester Kubernetes cluster. So if you come into this virtualization management, well, again, hamburger menu, we're going to be doing this a lot. Um, and I don't want to ma manage the cluster. I want to manage the cluster management tool would manage downstream clusters. Virtualization management tool manages the VMs and also manages the Kubernetes cluster itself. So I clicked this import existing cluster. And this is saying, here are your harvester clusters. Well, I want to manage the cluster. And this is very important because you can do things like, for instance, this is where you would go um, if you wanted to not deal with, you know, downloading the cube config of this uh, cluster, which you could do right here. You download the cube config. I have it ready to go for Harvester. I could copy it and then, you know, it gives you a, a nice cube config here. You paste it. You can do the whole export or you can just start running kubectl commands right here in this cluster and see what's run. Um, and so, for instance, if you want to install a, a tool such as Kassen, you can do it right here. You can extend the abilities of your Harvester cluster. Um, as we can see here, we have a lot of um, tools. Again, everything that I mentioned previously is running here. So we have Longhorn. We have the logging fluent bit um, up and going. We have monitoring. Uh, all of this is built into this Harvester cluster. It's the same concept as if you wanted to go look at the pods. You have these pods up and running. Um, as you can see, these are essentially what Kubert is using to create a Kubernetes cluster. So we have demos over here. You can actually come in and actually execute into that pod to start troubleshooting. So if you, you're not super familiar with Kubert, um, we give you the ability to just you know, manage those pods themselves that bring up those VMs. Um, and I think with that, you know, we can actually, um, are there any other questions, Brandon? Sorry if I have. No other questions. Uh, I am curious, how did you get that uh, that super secret uh, terminal to pop up there on the screen? Oh, yeah, let me show you. So this is actually with pretty much any instance of uh, a Kubernetes cluster in Rancher, we actually create, this will, this would just create a pod um, and it creates a pod that is essentially running a shell. And it's just this button up here. So, um, for instance, if I wanted to, you know, kubectl create pod, you know, define all the everything, like nginx, the typical thing, you can do it right here. Um, you can obviously create pods using our form um, as well. But if you are a command line savant and like delving into that only, you can do it right there on every cluster. This would this would work inside of the local cluster, this would work in or local cluster, and this would work inside of the webinar demo cluster as well. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there a secret key to uh, make that pop up as well? No, no. When you say yeah. secret key, yeah, it's uh, just, hot key, the uh, tilde. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Control, um, control. Uh, what is that? Oh my gosh. Yeah, control tilde. Yeah. Cool. And um, yeah. So I think that's actually a great segue because there is going to be um, a tool that you're going to see today, Kasten, built into Harvester, or yeah, built into Harvester, that uh, Brandon can actually go ahead and give you a demo. So um, again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. I'll be observing the chat now. Brandon was doing that so kindly for me, um, but he will take over and show you what's going on with Veeam Kasten. Um, so let's get that going. Hi guys, uh, Brandon back again. You guys have been hearing me answer or bug Austin with questions. Uh, but uh, uh, if you guys have any questions for me, please ask them during the, the presentation. Happy to answer them uh, on the fly as much as I possibly can. 
Uh, uh, same thing, we're going to go through a quick uh, couple of slides to explain the Beamcast and product, and then we're going to do a live demo, of course. Uh, so let's first start off with the Beamcast and history here and where we, where we are positioned inside of our ecosystem. So Veeam uh, uh, purchased the Casting product uh, around 2020. The Casting product has been around since 2017. And uh, we'll go into a little bit of history in the next slide, but what has kept us in the center of this target here of this, of this graphic on the right hand side is our focus on enterprise security features or enterprise features, including things like security. So uh, when we start talking about uh, Kubernetes as a whole, obviously approaching this with a strong security posture is very important for all of us. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces inside of this ecosystem that need to be protected, and one of those happens to be data protection. Uh, so we do that very well. We have, again, been doing it for the longest and, again, address it from a very enterprise uh, security focus uh, uh, standpoint on our own here. Let's go to the next slide. As I mentioned, security is everywhere, so uh, inside of our product. So when we start talking about casting, the casting product itself is protecting all of your workloads inside of Kubernetes, okay? And as, as far as integration with the various uh, parts of the ecosystem, naturally we are going to be able to integrate with your CI CD pipelines, inclusive of, uh, inclusive of working with things like OPA or any of your policy agents uh, that you might be adopting for policy enforcement and guardrails our ability to integrate with pretty much all of the OIDC uh, providers for authentication uh, is very important. And of course, we integrate with most of the secrets platforms as well for keeping those things nice and secure. And then ransomware protection. We integrate with all of the major providers of object storage, which provide us with uh, object locking. So it, again, uh, lends itself towards a very strong ransomware protection story from that aspect. Uh, and the last couple of things we're going to cover is the role-based access control. So obviously with a, a product like Casting can install into your environment with very advanced rights. And those advanced rights are going to be, uh, we need to basically tone that down a little bit for your individual users. So we basically provided you with role-based access control to provide self-service type ser uh, offerings for Casting. So that way you can provide people with, uh, uh, with lesser rights so they can protect their own workloads or their own namespaces inside of their Kubernetes ecosystem. And then auditing is the last piece we're gonna touch on before we leave, and that is, auditing at the Kubernetes level. So every operation that you might see uh, occur as, as I'm clicking around inside of the demo, just know that those operations are being recorded and stored inside of the Kubernetes native audit logs. So that way you can integrate with pretty much any of the SIMs that you have out there uh, from a, uh, again, a security po posturing standpoint. A little bit of history here, uh, Stateful Sets went GA right around the 2017 timeframe. If that sounds familiar, it's because that's when Casting started. So the founders of the organization uh, basically had the foresight to say, look, if we're going to persist workloads inside of Kubernetes, where for years we've had people like Kelsey Hightower come out and say that the world of Kubernetes is for stateless applications, they're to be ephemeral and go away whenever they're turned off. But again, that obviously, that story has changed and Kelsey himself has even uh, spoken on our behalf or on the industry's behalf for persisting data inside of Kubernetes because we can do it in a very effective way that is declarative uh, so that we can do it safely for our consumers of our applications. Uh, things like the uh, volume snapshot capabilities of the CSI drivers is something that we leverage as a product. So we don't bring storage to the table. We're actually working with your storage under the covers like Longhorn and the CSI driver to provide volume snapshots for those workloads in Kubernetes. And again, we're going to talk more about that as we go on. The three themes that we're going to cover today are going to be data recovery. Uh, obviously, we do a great job of protecting applications that are going to be deployed inside of Kubernetes, but we are also talking about virtual machines today. So those virtual machines do show up and present themselves as containers in the grand scheme of things. Uh, uh, Austin did a great job of covering that before. And what we do is, again, we reach in there and grab the uh, components that make up that virtual machine inclusive of the underlying storage or the the persistent volume that's underneath the covers uh, uh, supporting that virtual machine. So we can grab that entire thing, 
It's just as you would expect us to work inside of a, a VMware environment. We grab the VM and all of, its, all of its moving pieces and pick that up and protect that. So, and I'll explain how we do that in detail uh, as we go on. Data recovery, again, uh, we address this from a number of standpoints, but security being first and foremost. So encryption, access control, auditing, and then the ransomware protection. The final piece being data freedom. One of the things that uh, that we kind of struggle with as consumers of Kubernetes is as much as we would like to think that as a unifying platform that everybody speaks that same language of Kubernetes, there's moving pieces under the covers like storage that might change from one cluster to the next. And you need a product that can pick your applications up and move those from one environment to the next. And that's where casting comes in. So we have data freedom in the form of application mobility where we can actually pick those VMs or excuse me, pick up those applications and move them from one Kubernetes distribution type to the next. So I can bring stuff from the cloud uh, into a rancher environment or vice versa. Uh, I can go from one version of Kubernetes to the next. So if you guys are afraid of those uh, frequent upgrade cycles that we're forced to deal with for Kubernetes, just know that a simple mechanism might be to simply stand up a brand new cluster with that shiny new release and restore my applications into the new cluster very easily. So uh, we'll talk about how we can achieve that with the Beamcast and product. How do we work under the covers? So we're gonna talk about how we're deployed. On the screen, we have a control, we have some control plane nodes and some worker nodes under the covers. Those could be harvester, those could be rancher. It doesn't matter. Uh, in this example, obviously we've got a VM and uh, an application there. So uh, how do we work? We actually install into the RKE2 environment underneath uh, the harvester platform. So we're installing into that Kubernetes, into that Kubernetes distribution under the covers as a Kubernetes native application. So this is a 12 factor application, microservices based application living inside of that cast and IO namespace. It's gonna provide us with all the things we would expect out of a modern data protection solution. So we've got a nice, easy to use web UI, which I'll be demoing. Uh, obviously there's gonna be some CRDs that come along with this that are gonna extend the native capabilities of the underlying Kubernetes ecosystem. So we can take things like backup and restore operations and execute them using native cube control commands. That's important when it comes to automation and scripting because we can then be integrated with things like our CI CD pipelines or our infrastructure as code to either backup or deploy or migrate applications uh, as part of a declarative process, much like you would any other application inside of Kubernetes. We deploy via a Helm chart, super simple, or we're also in the SUSE Rancher application catalog that you guys will notice every time you uh, go into the Rancher um, uh, UI as well. So we're uh, deployable from both locations. Uh, we deploy to each one of your Kubernetes clusters. So that might sound a bit overkill, but I promise you it's not. It is two CPUs and four gigs of RAM, very small footprint in the grand scheme of things. But once we're there, again, we're able to protect all of your Kubernetes native workloads, VMs and applications included. All right. As I mentioned before, we take advantage of the native uh, storage capabilities of the, of the Kubernetes environment that we're being installed into. Uh, we're we're gonna use uh, Longhorn for our example here, but again, any CSI driver that supports volume snapshots, which most of them do, uh, this is what we lean on, is we execute a volume snapshot against the applications or the virtual machines persistent volume that's, under, that's uh, underneath the VM. And once that snapshot has been generated inside of Kubernetes, we're gonna make a reference to it inside of Kasten, okay? We're gonna make a reference to it and uh, all of the metadata that goes along with that, and it's called a restore point inside of our catalog. Once we've got that snapshot reference, we then mount that snapshot inside of our namespace as a persistent volume. And then we do the magic stuff after that. We take all of the data that's underneath that's inside of that volume that we've mounted from your snapshot, and we're gonna deduplicate it, compress it, and encrypt it before we send it off to the object storage of your choice. So we support pretty much everything that's out there, your uh, Google Cloud storage, S3, S3 compatible, Azure Blob, you name it, even NFS uh, are possible targets for being uh, backing up for a backup target inside of Beamcasting. All right, I'm gonna stop right there. Typically there's questions after that, but who knows? Uh, all right. 
looks like there is an SAP. I, I think I got this one. I was about to say, this one looks like, this got your name yeah. written on. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll let you handle that one. Uh, and if we need to surface that back up on the call here, let me know. Will do. All right, All right, guys, next slide. And again, uh, we're not sliding you to death today. We're just gonna uh, cover, we got two more slides and that's about it. Uh, this is what our application mobility and DR strategy looks like uh, in the grand scheme of things. And what I'm gonna point out is that I've got two clusters in this example. If you'll notice, we've got Veeam, Kasten deployed to both of them on the bottom and then the applications slash namespaces on the top. So a, a namespace is synonymous with an application inside of our product. So just know if I use that term application, I'm really talking about a namespace. So we take everything that makes up the application or the virtual machine, so all that metadata, the, the manifests that make up that virtual machine, including the persistent volumes, we take the data, again, package it up, deduplicate it, compress and encrypt, and send it off in that object storage. Once it's there in that object storage in the middle, it is completely portable for us. So we can take it and restore it into any other uh, uh, harvester environment that you might have. So we can take that VM from one environment, uh, maybe on-premises and restore it up into the cloud or vice versa, or from one version to the next. So again, there's that versatility uh, from an application mobility. And in this case, uh, VM mobility uh, for migrating those workloads. What makes this special though, is when we're talking about applications. So let's not forget, let's uh, forget about VMs for just a second and let's think about all the applications that are being deployed on top of Kubernetes. When we capture these uh, applications, we can transform them on restore to fit into any other Kubernetes distribution type. So what that means is when I restore, I can change the underlying storage. I can change the ingresses. I can change anything you can imagine, including the replica sizes, uh, of those applications on restore to make them fit into any other Kubernetes type. So that means, again, if I'm moving from one storage type to the next, casting can help. If I'm moving from one distribution to the next, casting can help you there as well. All right. Uh, this one slide I borrowed uh, from uh, some, some good friends in the ecosystem of Kubernetes, and this is where they have done, and this is a screenshot, so there's, there's, there's got to be a better quality of this somewhere out there in the world, uh, where we basically tried to marry up between the two ecosystems, between VMware and then the Kubernetes environments, uh, where you know, what what kind of syncs up to what, right? Uh, there's the concept of data stores inside of vSphere and volumes inside of Kubernetes and so forth. So what we've got on the screen here is basically a comparison of the two to try to help people get their heads wrapped around. So the concept of a virtual machine is basically a pod or a VM inside of Kubernetes. And inside of that, or outside of that pod, it's actually being held inside of a namespace, which is synonymous with a resource pool inside of VMware. Uh, this obviously is a work in progress and will continue to uh, evolve and there's some things that I would like to change about it as well, but uh, kind of help everybody get a, a level set of where we're at when comparing the two technologies. All right, guys, uh, the next piece we're going to cover is actually going into a demo of uh, the cast and product. Can I actually butt in and it looks like there is a great question um, as cast and takes the mobility approach from namespaces, I guess the VMs in Harvester are based on Kubert. Casting can move VMs only to a destination where Kubert exists as well, correct? That is correct, yes. We don't bring the Kubert with us. We, it needs to be there beforehand. Good question. And before anybody asks, no, we can't go from one Kubert version to another uh, before that one pops up. Uh, I, I got a feeling that one's coming. Uh, but uh, so no, we, we're gonna go from Harvester to Harvester, basically. Right. There are far better tools for VM migrations. All right, guys, let's go. We're going to exit out of this. All right. All right, guys, uh, in my environment, I've got my harvester, uh, we'll call it a cluster, it's a single node, um, but I've got a virtual machine running in it that I need to get protected. Let's figure out uh, let's figure out what we need to do to actually get that done. So we're going to uh, install Casting into the Harvester node. So again, uh, what that's going to do is basically uh, we're going to do a Helm install. Uh, at least that's the way I did it for my environment. 
and uh, the Helm install is pretty straightforward. It's uh, Helm install, K10, Kasten, K10, and then of course we specify the namespace and so forth. So it's just that easy. Once that's done, it's up and running. And uh, as part of the installation, we take advantage of the native ingresses. So what we end up with is this screen. Uh, and this is the Veeam Casting product. So this is actually running inside of the Harvester RKE2 system. So the, the underlying Kubernetes that's running Harvester, we are living inside of that. So we're taking advantage of all the native Kubernetes uh, resources that we have available to us, inclusive of, uh, again, those ingresses, the load bouncer, all that fun stuff, so that we can protect the virtual machines. So what we're gonna do is click on the applications here, and again, remember applications synonymous with namespaces. And I'm going to hone in on where that virtual machine lives. So let's go click on this. Where does this guy live? He's in the default namespace. And uh, this is the Just Enough OS. Uh, it's the cloud uh, distribution for OpenSUSE. So that's what I chose to use for my uh, virtual machine here. Let's go take a look at it real quick. See if there's anything of use in there. Let's go to Veeam. And yes, I know this is probably very tiny, but we cannot uh, do anything about that from this perspective, unfortunately. I think I can make it a little bit larger. No, we're stuck at this size. So what's in here? All right, we got something that's important. Why is it important? Let's go take a look at it. Uh, cat important. Huh. All right, let's do cat important. And then we're gonna pipe that out to base 64 and decode. And because I did the wrong thing. Oh, look, it's like a YouTuber. All right, so we've got some very important information we need to protect. So let's go protect that now. All right, guys, uh, we're going to go look in the default namespace. I just clicked D in the box up there. The casting UI is built in such a way to be super responsive. So if we had hundreds or thousands of namespaces in this uh, view, we can sort through them very, very quickly by just clicking on the box there and starting to type in the name of the namespace. So in this example here of the, of the default namespace, we see that there's a single volume out there, a single workload in the case, uh, in this case, a virtual machine, and then some of the uh, resources that are going to make up that re that virtual machine as well. So all those are going to be out there. We can see the contents of this by going and clicking on the ellipses on the right and going to details. And this is going to show us everything about that virtual machine that uh, Kasten is aware of from a Kubernetes perspective. So again, we got custom resources, we've got configs, networking, all that is going to be stuff that, again, we discover as an application. So as new applications and new virtual machines come into your cluster, Casting is gonna see those and actually uh, we can set up policies to automatically protect those virtual machines upon uh, being brought into the environment. So we do that using labels and I'll go into more of that in just a minute. So what we're gonna do is uh, click on this and do create a policy. So we're gonna create a policy to protect the virtual machines in the default namespace. I'm just gonna call, leave that as is. This is going to be this is going to be uh, similar to the way uh, this is going to be exactly the same way that we would protect a, an application inside of Casten as well. So we have the backup frequency. We can back up uh, virtual machines and applications as frequently as every five minutes. It's pretty aggressive. So again, that would be a snapshot operation that I would that that would be happening every uh, five minutes in this case. If we have multiple VMs uh, being protected by this single policy, we can stagger those over the course of a backup window. So we can actually use staggering and then select our backup window here. Snapshot retentions, this is actually for the snapshots on disk. Uh, the snapshots on the disk, obviously uh, this would be a very aggressive snapshot schedule. So we've got this convenient button here set to zeros and we'll put something a little bit more sane out there for that for snapshot retention. Again, this would be us talking to Longhorn, telling Longhorn to execute the snapshots uh, for the virtual machines. It's not a backup until it gets off the cluster, of course. So let's click this button here to enable backups via snapshot exports. And we can do, uh, we can select our backup target. In this case, I'm uh, uh, helping out our friends over at Wasabi. So they're providing us with an S3 bucket for this use case. So again, this is an S3 compatible uh, backup target that I'm backing up to. 
and I can keep the same retention schedule as above so that every uh, 12 uh, hourly backups or 12 hourly snapshots, or I can have a custom retention schedule, which is what we would recommend, so that way I can have more snapshots setting out on my uh, S3 object store. So fewer snapshots on disk, lots of snapshots out on the object storage. I think that's how most of us would probably design that. And we've got the application namespace here specified, but if I wanted to, I could go type in other namespaces. And while this looks great as part of a demo, at the end of the day, this is not how we're gonna do it as administrators. So what we're gonna do is select by labels. And what you can do is put a label on the namespace for your VMs, something very simple, something as simple as backup equals true. And now every namespace that has backup equals true is gonna get protected by this policy and get sent off to that S3 storage. All right, uh, the last piece I wanna cover before we move on is this piece, and that is the snapshotting of the cluster scoped resources. Sometimes in the world of Kubernetes, not everything lives very tidily inside of a namespace. Uh, so some things are cluster scoped, so like CRDs and cluster roles and cluster role bindings, we can capture those as well. And while you might think that would be an awful messy thing to, crack, to capture, you would be absolutely correct. So we have the ability to filter on those so we can do include or exclude filters to make sure that we get exactly what we need from those cluster scoped resources. Um, Istio is a great example. There's a lot of things that are moving in, inside of Istio from a uh, management perspective. So we can capture everything that makes up Istio and, and to include that into a backup. And the last piece is we can just create the policy and it would basically start the process of backing up that virtual machine. Or we can click this button here that I like, the YAML button. Everything that I do inside of Kasten is going to be declarative meaning that I can take everything that I do inside of the UI and it's going to build up a policy uh, uh, for me to where I can take this and integrate this with my CI CD pipeline. So again, we try to be as cognitive as we possibly can about the use cases that we're gonna be used with inside of a Kubernetes ecosystem. And that is making sure that we play nicely along with your DevOps and GitOps best practices. So when you're talking about protecting your applications in those environments where everything might be completely declarative, uh, just know that we can be integrated with that process and protect those applications at scale as you guys are adopting and staying uh, true to your GitOps or DevOps practices there uh, for deploying those applications. There are some questions in the chat if you want to take a quick yeah, answer. This is the perfect time to stop too. So hang on a second. It takes mobility approach from namespaces. I think we answered that one already. And let's see here. Yes, Kasten is uh, is a paid software. There is a free version that can be used for up to five nodes. So you guys can actually download and install Kasten in your home labs and demo environments, and uh, it will not bug you for licensing for up to five nodes. So that's uh, that's how I got my start with the product. Uh, so just know that you guys can get started today with Kasten uh, on top of Harvester inside of your home, inside of your labs and demos and in demo environments. And then does Kasten also work with uh, work as traditional Veeam backups regarding full incrementals? We are an incremental forever solution. So I think that's a yes. Uh, so to, to answer that question. So yes, there that's the first full backup. And then everything after that is the deltas or the incrementals. So hopefully that answers you guys' questions on that one. And then restores, we are going to cover restores in uh, in just a second, as a matter of fact. So uh, I wanna cover a couple of things before we move on to that. Uh, we've got the concept, obviously there's a lot of moving pieces inside of Kasten. So you can actually set up Kasten to back itself up. Crazy, I know, right? So we can actually back our own software up. And we would wanna do that because there's a lot of metadata that comes along with backing up applications and VMs, right? So a lot of that metadata is gonna get saved inside of our own catalog database. Uh, there's also uh, the concept of the policies and the blueprints and a lot of the other moving pieces that make the product successful, again, would all get captured as part of that backup process that you can then go back and very easily restore, again, as a part of a, uh, a declarative process, uh, scripted process, if need be. So in the event of a complete outage, we can des deploy a brand new Kubernetes cluster, 
deploy Kasten, restore it from the backup, and then start the restore process for the applications, again, using those declarative YAML files to execute those restore operations. So again, everything that we do inside of the environment should be able to be automated completely from beginning to end from a restore, from a backup perspective, all the way down to the restore operations. As you can imagine, we do install with those advanced rights. So I'm gonna leave this. And as we, we mentioned this earlier, uh, we can actually create new user roles. So I'm gonna create a new one for myself. And I've got role levels here. I can go specify specific namespaces that I've got access to. I don't know if it's on my end only, but I'm only, I'm seeing stuck on, I'm seeing that you're stuck on the restore page and your webcam froze. Oh no. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, but you're, I, I'm unsure if anyone else, I wonder if one of the, I wonder if it, Jamie, is it, is it frozen for you guys as well, or is this just a me instance? I don't, I just don't want this to be affecting anyone. Um, it's a little frozen for me. Okay. Um, let's see, I don't have any kids home watching YouTube or Netflix, so I don't know. Maybe what it's one of those like, turn off, turn on, turn off again, or turn off, like, just maybe like stop sh sharing and then reshare. Yeah. yeah. How about now? You just roll. Okay, now your user rolls. Perfect. Yeah, before perfect. you were stuck on the restore casting. Oh, perfect. Your mouse is moving again. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Thank you for telling me. I, that that would have been a very boring uh, demo otherwise. Yeah. Uh, I was like, so, wait, we're not, we're still in restore. Where's the rolls? I've seen this all before. Right. <laughs> on the, let's click on the button and actually do what I was talking about earlier. So Perfect. we're gonna create a new role-based access control for me. And what I can do is specify the namespaces that I'm gonna have access to. And then I can go give myself those rights to back up and restore. And what this means is the next time I log in, then I'm gonna have specific access to that namespace. And those are gonna be the functions that I'm gonna be able to execute. So this lends itself very heavily towards a self-service offering from Kasten. So that way you guys can and offload some of that day-to-day -day backup and restore operations to the application owners, if that's the way you guys are, are, are organized. Uh, we've got a lot of people moving in that direction, trying to make their Kubernetes environments as self-service as possible. And this definitely lends itself towards that uh, discussion. Okay, uh, the next piece we're gonna talk about here is the restores. So we're gonna actually gonna go up, gonna go back into our applications. We're gonna go find a, uh, find our default namespace here, click on it and do restore. So this is, if, any, if everybody can see this pretty well, uh, this is basically, we've got two panels here. We've got a blue one and a green one. And what this means is there's the blue one is the on the disk snapshot. So this is me being able to basically just take it and restore from that snapshot. The exported is what you would expect. It's sitting out on that S3 bucket for me and it's the exported via, uh, virtual machine snapshot. So in this case, I've got a full VM setting out in that S3 instance that I can restore from. So I'm gonna click on that. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna do a couple things. It's gonna tell me where my export profile is coming from, in this case, that S3 bucket. And then we're gonna surface this information. So this is again, us telling the user how to access the restore point using native kube control commands. So this uh, would, uh, we can actually take this and execute it against the environment. So I copied that and drop back over to Harvester real quick. Click the secret button, the tilde. And as it comes up, I'm gonna run this command and then we're gonna see what happens. Uh, what are the chances we've got JQ on here? Oh, you guys are great. Great. <laughs> SUSE is amazing. They put JQ on their uh, on their on their cloud connect here. So this is fantastic. So uh, this is everything that we're seeing in the web in the web UI. Again, just given given to us through raw Kubernetes commands. So again, again, it lends itself towards being automated and scripted very, very effectively in that case. So let's go back over here. We're going to keep scrolling down. So we backed up this virtual machine from the default namespace. I can tell you uh, with my little bit of knowledge that I've gained working with KubeVirt in various platforms that we don't want to do this. Um, it's just not a good practice to put stuff in the default namespace. So what I would probably want to do is restore this virtual machine out into a different namespace and I can create a whole new one. So I can go be new. 
VMs. And I can create that namespace. And that's where I'm gonna go send that brand new uh, virtual machine when I restore it. It's gonna go into this whole new namespace. So uh, while this does not sound very magical, uh, I can just tell you that none of the KubeVirt uh, products on the market today allow us to natively move a virtual machine from one namespace to another. So if you accidentally uh, did your migration from vSphere over into uh, the uh, Harvester platform and everybody just dumped it in default, you're stuck there. So <laughs> uh, you can then use the Casting product to back up those VMs and restore them into other namespaces as you see fit. All right, guys. Uh, as so I mentioned before, there was a oh. question. I, did you, I believe you had briefly gone over this, but um, like automating a DR plan. And yes. like rollback process, you can do all that. You know, we've... Yes, absolutely. So uh, automating this process is, is, is again, a, a, a matter of declaring the backup, pro the backup uh, policy uh, as a YAML file. And uh, that is something that, again, is developed under the covers as we're creating this, uh, creating that uh, backup of that restore operation as part of the UI here. Yeah. yeah, sorry, there was just like, uh, I think the, there was a question in the chat, I want to reiterate. Yeah. Let's see, I'm trying to like keep up with the questions too. So cast it in, sure theme, pros, good, we got some feedback. Cast and automate any DR plan and also the rollback process. Uh, no, so uh, the, the, as far as automation goes, we lean on our customers to choose their deployment technology. So your Terraforms, your Ansibles, your cloud, all everything you guys are probably using today to actually deploy your environment, that's what you would use uh, to then uh, take Cast and, and deploy it uh, into your environment from a, from a DR perspective. So we provide the mechanisms that are necessary to deploy Casting. Uh, declaratively, as well as uh, execute those backup and restore operations, again, declaratively. So it would be up to you to use your tooling to, to then deploy the application and the policies that would take effect to start the restore process for getting those applications and VMs uh, restored into the cluster that we're being installed to. Uh, rollback processes, I have not seen anybody even automate that today, but I get what you're asking for because we've had it with SRM and VM and VMware for a very long time, the ability to fail back. Uh, that is not a concept that we have mastered as of yet. Uh, so just uh, expect that that's probably something on our roadmap uh, for, for a future release. Uh, most of the time in the virtual machine world, uh, we are going to rely heavily again. Uh, it's not so much a casting issue. It is just the fact that we don't have the storage to support such an operation to do failbacks like that very easily. So it's, it's kind of a, a one direction kind of thing. Once, once we're migrated, we're kind of there, but then you can then, uh, set up restore operations to go back the other way. Again, it's up to you to declare that process to restore back to the other location, but there's nothing automatic that takes place. Great question though. Uh, as part of the restore process, guys, uh, as I mentioned before, there are things that we can do to the virtual machines in order to make them fit into our environment. So we actually have a, uh, a transform set uh, that we set. And again, the transform set is going to give us the ability to uh, make modifications to the virtual machines or the applications that we're restoring to make them fit into the cluster environment. And uh, we have this transform, which goes in and makes a modification to the metadata on the persistent volume and that that uh, that modification is basically telling the persistent volume who that who the persistent volume is owned by under the covers so we can actually remove that and make it fit into the environment if that's overly complicated i apologize it's really just a one-time thing that we do uh, for this particular environment uh, and that's and that's to get it to fit into uh, the harvester environment if if this were uh, it, one of the other things that we could do again is change the location of the storage so I can actually move, uh, we can actually transform the storage type from one type to the next. So if we were to move uh, in, in our example from Longhorn to maybe one of your uh, native storage providers, CSI driver, we can make that modification, that transform as well as part of that restore process. All right. 
All right, guys, I add a reference there. And then uh, we can also get selective. So again, uh, you might have namespaces with multiple virtual machines in it, perfectly fine. What we can do is get uh, uh, dig down into that environment. And a couple of things that you'll notice if you do have multiple virtual machines is we'll have multiple volumes here. So each, each virtual machine would have its own volume attached to it. And then we could go through here and find the virtual machine assets or a manifest that make up, see, here we go, virtual machine images and virtual machines. So this guy right here is actually the brains of the operation. This tells Harvester what that virtual machine is made up of, how much RAM, CPU, disk, all that fun stuff is going to be located inside of this manifest. And if we had multiple virtual machines, you would have multiple of these uh, uh, resources out there to choose from. So we can actually selectively pick each virtual machine that we want to restore, instead of doing them all at once, we can actually do them one at a time if, if you would like to do it that way and restore it into those new namespaces. All right, any questions there? All right, I'm gonna click the restore button and see what happens. All right, so let's go back and look at what a restore looks like through the magic of television here. So we actually already restored a VM into a different namespace. So uh, the restore operation took place and it took about three minutes. So that was three minutes and 45 seconds to basically pull an image down off of S3, uh, off, an, off an S3 bucket, serialize it, put it into a new persistent volume and spin that virtual machine back up. So three minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, that's I, I keep harping on that because that number is uh, is important for your RTOs and RPOs, obviously, and it's important as well from an operational standpoint when we're trying to figure out how long is it going to take uh, for these things to actually be executed. So uh, the target namespace, again, I backed up from default. I'm going to be restoring it into BNVMs, and again, we surface up those cube control commands that we can run to see in the event that this uh, successfully completed, which it did, uh, I could have something uh, triggered based off of this operation. So again, I can take this, oper this uh, command here and go back over to the harvester environment and do the same thing and find out, oh, we disconnected already. And there we go. and jq all right so this is all of the uh everything that occurred as part of that restore action again all of this stuff is completely available to you via the native cube control commands so that things can be automated and scripted and let's go find what we all came to look for and that is you restored the app you restored the virtual machine supposedly so where is it so we're in the default namespace right now i'm going to go click on this and there we go. We are now in the BNVMs namespace, and there's our virtual machine up and running. And uh, if anybody wants to go see me go through that silliness again, we can see this. Same thing. All right. So we we uh, persisted our super secret, super important information. Uh, backed it up, restored it into a different namespace, and now uh, we have a completely protected application, uh, virtual machine that uh, we can set up for a schedule and have it backed up on a regular cadence, as you would all expect. And we could even go through the process of restoring that on a regular cadence as well. So um, that's, uh, again, for those multi-cluster environments where I might want to back up a virtual machine from one environment and restore it into a completely different one, this is where you would do that uh, operation is inside of Kasten. Guys, I have, uh, that is, the last piece I wanna talk about is blueprints. So as part of the restore operation, uh, I, let's, instead of talking in, in maybes here, let's go back to this. I'm gonna go back to my default and click on this and go to restore. And we're gonna scroll down here. There are these pre and post restore action hooks. Stick with me here. Imagine this is a database virtual machine. I'm not sure why you wouldn't be why you wouldn't just run a database natively on top of Kubernetes, but that's neither, neither here nor there. Uh, let's say it's a it's an app it's a database. What we can do is reach into that database using our blueprints and quiesce the database before we execute a snapshot. 
Everybody understands databases enough to understand that we need to do that to get a clean backup of a database. So that way, if you're in the middle of a transaction, it's not setting up in memory while all of his friends are happy, happily sitting on the disk. We can actually uh, uh, run queries uh, before and after snapshots take place in order to ensure a good clean backup of that database. And we do that using blueprints. One of the other things is in this case, on successful restore, I can actually have queries executed against that database using its native language. So we'll pick on SQL for a minute. So let's say it's a Postgres instance sitting on your top on top of your VM. I can actually run a uh, as part of the restore process, actually execute a query against that database to make sure that it's returning a query as I expect it. So not only is the virtual machine going to be considered uh, uh, healthy to Kubernetes and functioning. Maybe it's got an IP address and all those other fun things, but we can actually go a step further and test the validity of the underlying database itself by running queries against it. So that's something that we can do with blueprints. And I'm going to show you real quick what a blueprint looks like. Uh, no, I'm not going to show you what a blueprint looks like because I'm not in my environment. <laughs> oh, and still here. Come on, guys. Nobody pay attention to that uh, other screen, by the way. I just realized what that said. Um, blueprints. We're going to go show you what a blueprint looks like, and we're going to pick on MongoDB for just a second. So MongoDB has uh, native operators as well as Postgres and MySQL. All of the cloud native database technologies have some mechanism to quiesce the database. And what that's going to look like for us is a blueprint is a little bit of YAML to set the set the tone for uh, interoperating with Kubernetes, as we can all expect. And then what we end up with is this last piece is the arguments here. So we've got the uh, the capability to run the Mongo shell. So this is the client that executes against the database. So again, Postgres is going to have PSQL, Mon uh, MySQL is going to have its own. All these guys are going to have some mechanism to talk to their own database using their own language, and we can script that using these uh, using these blueprints so that we can basically take advantage of those native uh, operators inside of those database technologies to get a clean backup or, in the example I gave earlier, a good clean restore operation where I can test the validity of that database uh, and say that it is in fact up and running and functional. So. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, uh, one of the other things that that blueprints provide to us. As as you can imagine, if anybody's if a light bulb, I hopefully went off went off for everyone, is that I can run anything from a command line executed by Kasten as part of this operation. So any even database technologies that are sitting outside, if they have APIs that you can manipulate in order to execute things like snapshots. We can script all that, again, using these blueprints. So there's really not a whole lot that you can't do, either pre or post backup restore operation uh, from, a, from a blueprint standpoint. Any questions there? All right. Guys, uh, from a presentation standpoint, that's all I had for today. Uh, Austin, was there anything, did, did you see any questions that I there missed? One, one last question. Um, sure. Did you touch on the NFS mount on a VM? By the NFS mount on a VM and cast NFS done on that VM backup will also include the information on the NFS mount point. Uh, the information will be housed inside of that mount, inside of the virtual machine, if I understood you correctly. Um, I wish we could have people just come off of mute, but um, if I understood correctly, so you're going to mount the the NFS volume on the VM. Casting is going to back up the VM and the persistent volume under the covers, and that's it. We're not going to back up the NFS mount itself. Um, so uh, hopefully that makes sense. Oh, yep, that answers the question. Perfect. All right. I like it when I can answer questions. Uh, any other questions, guys? All right. Perfect. I'm going to hold on a second. I'm going to flip back over and show our prezo. Oh, you were about to do it? Okay. <laughs> oh, you can do it. Show. There it is. There we go. 
All right, guys, uh, the fun and awkward time, and that is taking your phone out and getting a picture of the QR code to fire it anyway. Uh, or you could just go to the URL on the bottom or wait till we send you guys the copy of the slides, which everyone is going to get as part of participating in today's presentation. Uh, you will get a copy of the slides uh, as well as the recording from uh, today's presentation as well. Uh, I'm just going to leave that up on the screen. If there's any other questions, please fire them away. Uh, I see another one in here. Nope, same one as earlier. And I think we're good. Guys, thank you all for your time today. Uh, this has been a blast for, for Austin and I. I know we, we really enjoyed working together. We had a chance to work together in Minneapolis a few weeks ago. So uh, this is very fun for us. Uh, we get to geek out with all of our uh, fellow Kubernetes people. So this has been very fun. And if there's any questions, Austin and I are both available uh, as as part, or, or you can reach out to either one of us over our LinkedIn. I think that's in the deck as well that's gonna be shared. Happy to answer questions. Uh, happy to, to obviously sit down with your organization's uh, specific needs uh, from a harvester standpoint, as well as being cast in, and uh, answer your questions uh, live and in person if, if you guys would like that. And then of course, uh, addressing everybody's uh, burning desire to uh, migrate onto Kubernetes as quickly and fast as possible. So, Austin, any questions there or anything uh, you no, want to sounds ask? good. And uh, kudos. I also have been loving these, uh, these presentations. I'm sure we'll be able to get another one under our belt soon. Absolutely. All right, All right guys. Yeah, if you have any other questions, we, uh, we can stay here for a few seconds or we can, yeah, like, like Brandon said, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, do you have, I guess we'll wait for them to make sure that they've done all the QR code scanning and given some feedback. Um, we are gonna be giving away some, uh, like we're gonna have some reach out to you guys and there's gonna be some uh, free swag from SUSE coming your way if you uh, follow up with us. So be, look up, be on the lookout for that. Um, cool, and if, uh, if that's it, I think we can probably Stop the broadcast. We will be sending out the slides and a recording of the entire presentation and demos. So be on the lookout for that as well. Um, thank you so much for the time, guys.